Okay. Well, we have uh, quite a few uh, questions. And um, let me come in here to the, the questions. Um, what, how do you guys adjust the pH at the, uh, the digester? I'll, I'll, I'll just leave this here on your truck. That's great, Matt. Uh, and just, I will. You're on, you need to unmute, Andy. I'm sorry. That was, that was actually an important emergency. So <laughs> there we go. Um, anyhow, um, how did we adjust the pH of the digester? Yes. While we're running, it's something we monitor, and almost always the solution is manure. That's what we, uh, I look at it, we look at if, if we're tr having troubles, if we thought we did something wrong with a substrate or something like that, um, more fresh cow manure is nine times out of 10 is the answer. It's like buffering in a, a cow's gut. Good old manure was a, is a good thing. It self-corrects then. Okay. Um, how many years was the digester in operation before you cleaned it out? I think it was it's from 08 to 19, whatever that is. Okay. 11 years. 10 or 11 years. And um, how much did it cost? With the complete rebuild, we spent about three hundred fifty thousand dollars, and it, it, you know there was we we provided a lot of that labor in there, and we did we basically did the whole job ourselves. So I think if you had a that was probably a, a close to two hundred thousand dollars savings just that if you would have had a had it all done, it would have been a big big job. Right. And then what uh, can you tell us the cost of the cleaning? I can tell you the cost of the. So of the 350, I think we spent there was eighty thousand dollars in panels, probably another um, another eighty thousand dollars in all the foaming and the treatment, uh, the, the scooping of the thing, the scooping and trucking was probably about $40,000 worth of investment. Um, you know, the time you, you rent track hose, you rent trucks, and you, you have it hauled. So that those are how we controlled it. But um, that's the best I recall. Okay. Uh, let's see. We have a question about the, the AD solids. Are they composted or some land applied? How, how, do, how are you... How did you utilize those solids? We ended up land applying them on real distant fields is what we did. We hauled them. We hauled them where there was, where there was need. Some of it, we actually, I think there was some that ended up getting uh, blended with our normal compost and uh, exported that way also. Okay. It was actually a fairly nice material. My wife wanted some on her garden. I know that. <laughs> do, you, do you use any of those solids for bedding, Andy, in any of the barns? Um, only on one one barn of all of our, you know, our dry cows are bedded with with the composted digester manure, but everything else is sand bedded. Okay, let's see if we have any more questions for Andy. I know we had a few comments. Um, okay. All right. Well, we have a few, we have some more questions, I think, for the rest of the panel. Um, Let's see, would you recommend a real-time nutrient analysis during lagoon pup down and wood equipment? Um, I think, yes, I think that's the, the questions about the, the dairy lagoon and land applications. 
Um, so yes, I think it would be a good idea as you can see from some of the data that we show, there was significant um, variations in terms of the nutrient supply uh, from day to day. So it would be ideal if we can, in the future for work like this, to make sure that there is a, a, a real time nutrient um, monitors and then couple it with the uh, using the output to adjust the uh, the application rates to provide a more consistent uh, and then there are some some uh, I think on the commercials they, the John Deere's have uh, at least uh, what they call the harvest lab sensors uh, that are being deployed in the fields already so that we have some colleagues uh, across different states are trying to follow up with that so I think uh, in the future, we'd like to follow up with some of those uh, to see if, if we can present some of those data. Um, so that's, that's a quick answer to, to that question. I think some of these questions we've already typed in in the answer box too. Mahmoud did also. Let's see. Um, we have another question for Andy. Um, Regarding the, uh, well, I lost it. There was a question regarding the uh, the waste grease. Okay, so you mentioned you took waste grease from the grease traps. Is there a formula for a grease ratio to other inputs? Um, I don't know if there's a perfect formula, but less is best. You know, we have a 30% limit of, of, of substrate that we can use. And I can tell you, we try to limit, uh, John could answer this more correctly. I Five think 10%. Was, there you go. 10%, okay. I do have All a question, right. if, if it's possible for you, Andy and John. Um, when you uh, started to uncover the digester, were there specific spots where you had most of the solids accumulating or it was pretty much uniform throughout? It, it was worse at the beginning in the first half and it, and it just, it slowly got, it went from really, really thick at the beginning or really, I don't know, I'd guess it was probably 10, 12 feet of solids. And by the time it went around the corner, it was probably down to eight or six and, uh, and down to probably two by the time you got to the end. I see. Okay, no, that's, that's helpful. Thank you. Okay, we have a question about the uh, the operation of the digester. Um, the basic question is, how difficult is it to operate? That's for John to answer. Some days it takes 5% of your time, and some days it takes 120% of your time. The difficulty in operation is probably a direct correlation to the diet that it intakes and your management of that diet and uh, your daily PM list. There's, a, there's not a day out of the year that you can forget about anything on your PM list. Daily checks of motors, pumps, levels, temperatures, um, you know, on a good day when everything is healthy, you can be in and out in 30 minutes or less. But uh, knowing what's happened in the last two weeks and predicting what's going to happen in the next two weeks is, is real important information. But I think it all stems back to really having good engineered piping and design and uh, first and foremost, your diet. Okay, uh, we have a question about, uh, and this may be for uh, all of the panelists, uh, for information on accumulation of foreign matter, such as plastic, shorts, metal, and lagoons and digesters, where food waste is added. Um, Ontario has introduced new regulations and there are new rules for testing before land application. So maybe we could start with John or Andy uh, as far as what you're seeing uh, as, uh, in the foreign matter. 
Yeah. So as, as far as probably the most common foreign matter that, uh, that comes into our facility, it's mostly going to be connected with food waste that comes from the backside of grocery stores. So we're talking, you know, the stickers on bananas uh, in store that, that don't get removed before veggies and fruits are put in the, into different machines to get ground up. That's probably the biggest evidence that comes through all the way through the system. Uh, what, you, what you're really depending on at the end of the day is all the companies that generate these waste streams, you know, they have, they have, you know, could have a hundred or 200 employees that are responsible for taking care of it and generating that product before it gets sent off. And, uh, you know, realistically, can we rely on, on everybody that doesn't know where the end of this product is going to be to think about the ramifications of not taking out the, off that sticker. That's, that's probably the hardest part as, uh, as we deal with different companies that, that bring in waste streams is really harping with, on employees and training, you know, the, the first and foremost responders um, to think about the, the ramifications of that foreign material. So it we're, I'm in a, I'm in a constant state of, of talking with different, companies to to prevent that but uh to say that there's regulations going to be put in place that prevent it i don't see it it's all a training it's all a training and uh and communication problem thank you uh how do you measure the efficacy of the digester and other co-benefits or the tribes that you are working and communities that you are near your facilities and AD satisfied with improvements in water and air quality? Andy, you're muted if you're trying to answer. So I was stalling, hoping John would answer. I think the tribe is. <laughs> I'm thinking that the tribe is, has been very happy with the results. As you know, I think they've we've hoped, and uh, the big hope that they've had and we've had that it's it can be an example of proactively working together um, uh, to do do something good. Um, we'd be the first one to say, and, and they would be that, and they would admit the same thing too, that neither of us are, are perfect ever at any stretch. And uh, there's always room to improve things and you keep on working at it, but it's uh, the concept of uh, people working together and owning a problem. Uh, it's like a lot of societal problems. It's a, uh, it's a whole lot easier to point at the other guy than, uh, than, admit that you're part of the part of it also you know that's one of the miserable things about being a dairy farmer at times is you find that you're uh, you're at the root end of a lot of issues and what's nice is uh you know the guys of the tribe you know the first thing they'd say was well we kind of like dairy products just like we like fish and uh and how do you come up with reasonable good solid answers and solutions and uh and we, is it perfect? No, but it's a lot closer and we'll continue to work in the future. And I think that's the key, just working towards a, a, the right destination. You know, I, Joe quit. He retired way too soon. You know, we were going to have this nutrient partition thing all figured out perfectly, you know, so it could just magically like go to where it had to be. But uh, <laughs> we're closer, but we're not there. We have another question for you, Andy. How has the digester and added food waste impacted your nutrient management program? I well, I love it because because to me the big deal is is that nitrogen is readily available and and when you on your grass fields it is such a nice product to use. It, it's you have a nice 
thin material that you can put out there that that is it's a very manageable you know that's to me that's the, a big ticket item you know i think that's the part of the farmer side of you that you really really like um you know john does a good job watching the, the different nutrients and and watching which substrates will take or not take and we're in the privilege of being able to be fussy about that so it isn't like you just take anything if there's something that you go i we don't we don't want that we don't need that there's too much of this or too much of that in it he, we've had the opportunity to to do that and say okay that that's a yes or this is a no I'd follow, I'd follow that. I'd follow that up with, uh, you know, some of the biggest impacts that it's had to our nutrient management program has just been implementing technologies and automation that, that gains you way more precise information than what you had in the past, you know, flow meters, uh, GPS on tractors that drive, that can drive themselves and measure outputs as they're being applied in real time, being able to in real time measure nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and have GPS co coordinates on maps, uh, exa you know, exactly where you're locating everything. But just the whole system altogether has just really brought a lot more efficiency in the way things get done. And, and control over situations that, you know, in the past, when you didn't have automation, it was, oh, go drive two, mi two miles to the, the pump station and manually shut the pump off, off or on. But now it's all at your fingertips. You're driving your tractor and you're shutting off your pumps or controlling flow rates from your phone. It's just, uh, yeah, adapting technology on the farm has just been a huge benefit. Okay. Has uh, so in some of the other presentations, uh, the copper and zinc levels were were managed, and so the question is: Has anyone had to adjust nutrient applications based upon copper or zinc level of the sludge? As far as the uh, the digestate that comes out of our digester, when we talk about new nutrient applications, we are pretty much looking mostly at nitrogen and phosphorus. So the concentrations of the liquid that's being pumped out the fields, you're, you know, copper and zinc is not a limiting factor as far as application. It's gonna be nitrogen and phosphorus that's banked in the soil and has to be calculated uh, you know, as to how much the plant is gonna uptake uh, during the growing season nitrogen and phosphorus are our limiting factors. So copper and zinc um, are never at high enough levels that that uh, would need adjustment on applications. We do see it, however, down here east, especially in sludge removal from anaerobic lagoons and especially with specific crops. Uh, we know uh, peanuts, uh, we know cotton to a degree that can suffer some stresses from both cotton, uh, from, sorry, from copper or zinc. And uh, that has been some of the challenges that some of our growers have faced based on track record of over applying sludge that was high on one or the other, that somehow has sort of deterred potential crop growers from accepting sludge applications for that particular reason. A question I have on that, is that because of, uh these are dairies that are using copper and zinc as a, not as a feed additive, but probably as a, as in a foot bath or something like that for foot health. So uh, I apologize. I needed to clarify that Andy, I'm talking primarily on swine. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, in the feed and um, mainly because our system is operating on a longer time horizon to where that sludge has been building up over right. you know, decades. Um you see that concentration and yeah. uh, actually a lot of the zinc also comes from um, in a smaller uh, operation in the uh, not in the grow finish phase, but earlier on as an antimicrobial ingredient in the feed. Uh, and that's okay. generally where, where it is enriched.
Okay, well, I appreciate all of the uh, the questions and, and the answers uh, from the panel.